Thank you very much, Marky. Now, we're going to have a bit of a discussion, and we are very interested in hearing input from folks in the audience. And as I mentioned before, there are microphones back there. So if you have a question, please go so that uh, the recorder can pick up your sound. But if there are no questions immediately from the audience, one thing that I was interested in maybe going down the line here and talking a little bit more about is this idea of margin and the ways that some of the panelists have talked about margins and whether or not margin is a problematic term in relation to their own research. So I thought maybe we could have some little sound bites down the row if someone wanted to start with that panel. Chelsea? <laughs> when I think about margin um, and the West on the margins, I don't, I mean, it's hard for me to think of that because I live in the West and it doesn't seem like a marginalized place that people, you know, especially in Oregon, you know, the Oregon Trail, there was a lot of um, people really wanted to go there and they thought it was going to be pretty awesome. Um, but what I do think is uh, marginalized populations within the West and you know anywhere really, but um, in these Western communities, and especially when we look at these communities sociologically, there was a lot of populations that were marginalized and therefore underrepresented in the in this history of American, you know, in American history. That now, as archaeologists, we are uniquely qualified to bring those stories back to life. So that's what I think about when I think about margins in the West marginalized populations and, and how we can you know, tell their story. Right, which which actually makes the archaeology relevant to American history. <laughs> we are not. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, I, I would actually like to talk about how we archaeologists, not, not to go po us on you, but we are marginalized in terms of the other disciplines studying the West, specifically the historians. I wonder who the reviewer was on that committee, um, but I, I think that maybe we might get into too much trouble if we become hyper-regionalized. Should we go toward a Western historical archaeology like the historians have gone to a Western history? I was kind of curious to see if any of the panelists here were actually going for that or if anybody in this room is. Um, but I would worry then that, oh my gosh, if we already feel marginalized in terms of some of our other colleagues and other fields, what if we start to disassociate ourselves and become irrelevant to other historical archaeologists by being too particularistic and hyper-regionalized? I don't know how to answer that question, but I'm going to throw it out there. <laughs> my sense is that Margin is a relative thing. I guess as a somebody that spends a lot of time in port in ports, I think ports are places where the margins come together. And I think that societies on ships and societies that born in these places represent the margins from elsewhere. Maybe that's part of the frontier dynamic. But I think what makes them special is that the margins and the converging. And in time, I guess the bigger dominant culture will overtake and try to homogenize it. But I think that, again, it's where, it's where the best part of what we do as people is. It's where we really interact. It is, it is that bar and star for us. You know, it's, it's because we all get there from elsewhere. Getting away from something, going to something, ostensibly to a market, which really ultimately is a way back to where we came. Let's see this one first. Yeah. So, thinking about the two areas that I, I spoke about tonight, first of all, people who live in the Bay Area, I'm pretty certain it's the center of the world. <laughs> so, no sense of marginality there. But, Fort Davis, which, as we showed on the map, is pretty much in the middle of nowhere. They do not recognize that. They do not see themselves as the margins. They are in the center of their world. And I think the problem with the term marginality is people can feel marginalized as a social process. But in terms of a geographic process, you know, people who are dance, they think it's nor normal that you drive 87 miles to go to a Walmart. I'm going to drive 87 miles and Walmart's not going to be my 
destination, but yeah. there you go. So the, the term geographically is not necessarily useful. There's also like football minutes versus real minutes in terms of mileage on the East Coast versus the West Coast. <laughs> and the thing that I noticed having grown up on the East Coast, oh my God, you drive an hour, that's crazy. Why would you drive an hour? You're in Massive, you know, I was in Connecticut. So you're either in Massachusetts or New York, or Rhode Island, and you're like in another state, that's crazy again. Whereas, oh, we're gonna go down to Los Angeles, we'll drive six hours. And you're like, yeah, we're doing that for the, yeah, for, for a museum visit, for a movie. I mean, to hang out because there's a really good Brazilian restaurant there. So it's just, you know, Western miles are a whole different thing than East Coast miles. You better hide. So, <laughs> I said that. So, I have to agree that when we talk about marginalization, it's fair to talk about marginalization than margins. And I think edges is a more productive language than margins. All right, I want to wrinkle it one more time. Because um, I kind of agree with the idea that marginalism and marginality is one of the one of the commonalities amongst the three regional identities that I've now sort of waded through um, is that there's a really profound distinction between the way that these regions are perceived and defined by insiders versus outsiders. So I think marginalia might be an aspect of perspective. But I want to go back to a word that I think it was Chelsea uh, who used it originally, and that's liminal. Um, and I think while the West may not be marginal, especially to the people who live in it, it has often been a liminal space in terms of the way that people behaved in it and towards it. And that might be another vocabulary word to add to this. Um, I think when we were talking earlier at dinner tonight, um, I ended up saying that, that the West wasn't marginal until the 20th century. Um, and I based that on some of my own work that was done in Nevada, looking at deindustrialization. Hello, Tim Scarlett, I see you sitting here, man. Um, but it's the West in the 18, late 1880s and early 1890s, especially the inner Montana West. Um, Nevada regained its 1880 population just after 1983. Um, so it, there was a boom and then collapse, and then a slow crawl back, driven mostly by Vegas. Um, so I think one of the ways we might want to think about this in addition to geographical marginalia and marginal status is economically. Because the West was the United States' first colony. And colonies are often peripheral and marginal, regardless of what the people who live in them think about their status. So if we flip gears and think more economically and in terms of the way, the role that the region play in the larger global processes, you can't miss what happens at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century in the West, or you don't understand in large part what the huge drive was to create that 20th century version of the myth. Because in a lot of ways, it was about bringing back the golden years, even if it was as a golden idyllic past, in the context of what was at the time economic collapse and hardship and depopulation in the West. Great, thank you. We have a question over here. You're up. Uh, hi, thank you very much. Uh, I actually, my question is about the one cardinal direction that you didn't talk about. Uh, any of you, and that's the North. Uh, and for those of you who are trying to define the West and who are trying to talk about marginality and liminality and borders and peripheries, how do you feel about the North, particularly in relation to the West? I mean, when we look at it cartographically, is it simply the 49th parallel? And for those of us who study things that go on in North America that aren't American, uh, I think we would probably dispute that. And I'm just wondering how you feel about talking about some of these things which you see in Canada, in Alaska, 
and in further regions. Does anyone want to take that? Yeah. Well, being the dual national Canadian up here, <laughs> I, I do have to respond. And I guess the first part is you're absolutely right. And I think what I should have said, actually, in my remarks with the Big Ocean, is that that includes the Arctic. And that seeming peripheral zone was actually front and center of a lot of When James Cook kicked the door open for global commerce in the Pacific, he famously came not just to observe the transit of Venus or find Hawaii, but to go to try to find the entrance to the Northwest Passage in the West. And that passage, that quest for that passage, that four hundred years of striving to get a shortcut to fulfill the dream of Columbus and open that market is absolutely paramount and part of it. And while that endeavor was largely confined to thrusts by various expeditions, a number of them failed by fur traders and trappers, and ultimately always known and ever conquered by the people that lived there in the first place, that is a key part of it. But I wouldn't appropriate all of the Northwest Passage of the Arctic to the idea of the West, but rather back in terms of a boundary, I think it is part of the pan-ocean connection. And likewise, everything that then happened up there, not just on the maritime side. And I'd also note, too, that in terms of what I look at, which is gold rushes, a lot of these players just simply go from place to place. And so it is that James Marshall famously discovers that gold in California originally came from North Carolina where in 1839 he participated in that rush. And you have Californians who aren't really Californians. They come to California, then they go to Nevada and Comstock, then they go to the Caribou, or they go into the interior of British Columbia for the 1858s, right? They go to the Rand for diamonds, they go to Australia, they go to the Klondike in 1897 and beyond. They're always bouncing around, always going in search of that wandering star. And in that, ultimately connected all together again. So the West, the Northwest, all of them intimately and powerfully tied. I think perhaps what you see here is the fact that all of us, you know, hail from or in have an affinity with that great vast state to the South, which people both love and hate, and which has played a pretty dominant role. But the other part I would add to that, and thank you for this, is for me, the West isn't just the North, it's farther south. What happened in Panama, what happened in South America, the parallels of Valparaiso, Lima, Callao, Guayaquil, as well as out into the vast Pacific, where we didn't even need to talk about Hawaii, which is why Hans stood up. It's all part of it. Thank you. Brilliant question. Well, let's turn over here. Yes, Mr. Hansen. Thank you very much. Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> <laughs> I do have work with Jim. I've been in Hawaii for 20 years. As a maritimer, I, I echo the issues we have with borders and boundaries versus highway. Very interesting. I think that, um, you know, in my own life, I'm starting to get to a point where I'm having problems with the terminology. We've already heard west is south, west is north. East is that. Which east are we talking about? I would like to make some remarks about Hawaii and pose a question, but before I do, I just, I'm very, I'm so curious. By show of hands, I would just like to know how many people take their shoes off before they go in their front door? <laughs> oh, I'm so proud of you all. <laughs> um, we should all be familiar with Hawaii's past and, and you know, what happened there. And, uh, you know, with all due respect to Pearl Harbor, uh, if you know about the past of Noir, you've been there, you're familiar with the important role of Japanese immigration in the plantation period and the fisheries, and what that means for our culture and why. And you're familiar with the Chinese diaspora and what that meant for why. And of course, and by no small part at all, the Polynesian migration, the original discovery of why, the Lakita theory. Those are eastward movements. And uh, so I would just caution, and I'm glad to see a question mark come up about Hawaii tonight. It's fantastic work. As 
that I'm starting to call it Inset Hawaii because I've been watching the Weather Channel. <laughs> it's not even close enough to be on the river. Okay? <laughs> Uh, uh, there will be a resistance in Hawaii to the concept or suggestion that Hawaii is on any western periphery or western edge, certainly. Uh, a good number of tourists that come out to Hawaii ask legitimately what they need a passport. And I don't think that number's going down, actually, oddly enough. And of course, Godzilla comes from the east. So, these, these questions have been in my mind about boundaries and terminology, and I'm glad to see Hawaii come up tonight. And the question then would be, I guess, besides Pearl Harbor, and besides our economic reality, of course, and what we are now, um, is there, are there other cultural arguments for proposing Hawaii as a Western group? Well, I might jump in on this a little bit because um, some of the work that I've been doing in Hawaii has been really informed by my original positioning from some, as someone from the East. And you, when you start working in a historical, the so-called historic period in Hawaii, there, that is a, as blurry a boundary as you can get where, where those differences are. You start to really see the way that the West is kind of a false destination. And because, of course, with so many people from New England settling and missionizing in Hawaii, you have that kind of influence. And the incredible hodgepodge of, of ethnicity that you get, and I would add the influence of Japanese in the ranching industry as well, in that respect. And that tags on to another question I think we, that someone might want to address in relation to mobility, because I think that that's one thing that when you work in the West, working in Hawaii certainly brings this forward, is you really have a sense that all that the people that you're looking at came from a place to a place and maybe moving on to another place. We've had some folks touch on that a little bit. So maybe someone wants to fold in this Hawaii idea that Chelsea I know has worked on also Hawaii is in on the mainland as well. So do you want to jump in on that topic? Um, sure. Uh, working in Southern Oregon, um, every day driving into town, I drove by, by a place called uh, Kanapa Flats. And I had no idea what it meant. I heard it was a wild, crazy mining camp. So um, I went out there to do some research and found out that it was home to a population of Native Hawaiian miners um, in, during the Oregon Gold Rush. And what I found to be really interesting about that was how, um, two things. Number one, how absolutely absent that is from the historiography, not only of Southern Oregon, but just of the Gold Rush in general. You know, every once in a while you might mention. Um, but uh, the second thing was how it was right in front of us, all over these maps. Um, in Jackson County alone, there's like five or six locations that have a plate name linked to the Native Hawaiian population during the Gold Rush. Um, and this is something I've been looking at also with the, uh, my work on the, the Chinese miners in the area. And one of the things I'm going to talk about on Saturday in a session is that there was a, a fire this summer in Southern Oregon on China Gulch Road, and there, or China Gulch, and there's a China Gulch Road near me, but there's also four other locations um, with the name China Gulch in a really small area in Southern Oregon. Again, a testament to these populations that came um, you know, stayed for a short time and then moved on, and in some cases, that's what's left in the documentary record of these populations. And and in particular, uh, with the Chinese uh, quarters and towns, after a lot of them burn, you have very, you know, the the built component of these these neighborhoods is really erased. So it's it's really hard to track down some of these populations because they were mobile and because um, some of the sites could be ephemeral. So there's a lot of clues there, some of them right in front of our face, but there's a lot of work to be done to kind of um, try to grab onto these populations that were so mobile and didn't establish the same type of, um, you know, there's not that, that connection to the modern communities as much always, but they were nonetheless really important to the infrastructure um, of the places that that have resulted from their tenure. Anyone else want to chime in on that issue of mobility in their own work? Marty? Anybody over there? Where's Lori? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Wow. Um, 
Yeah, mobility. I I want to I want to do a slight uh, diversion, and then I'll turn it back over to Jim. Um, thinking about this idea of both the comment about you know where's New York in this picture, and what do we do with all this terminology? This is one of the reasons why I think if you work less of that magic parallel that that Kelly was talking about, you really ought to be looking at the Pacific is because of the point that Jim was making earlier about the mobility, the interaction, the flow of people that's facilitated by the Pacific itself. So when I'm in the classroom in California, I do this, this absolutely heretical thing to my California students. I explain to them that Sutter gets to California by way of Honolulu. He goes to St. Louis and then he goes north with a team of fur trappers who drop him off in Vancouver, Fort Vancouver, Hudson Bay Company. He then hops on a ship that's a Hudson Bay Company ship that's heading to China that stops, of course, in Hawaii, where he picks up a Hawaiian wife and an entire crew of Native Hawaiian laborers who become the first navigators um, of non-Native Californian descent on the Sacramento River and who work for Sutter as Fort. Um, there are still descendants of those families in Sacramento today. So if you leave the Pacific out, you lose a whole realm of that mobility that really doesn't have a compass point to it. It's not north, it's not east, it's not south, it's not west. It's everything. And it's constantly moving. It's not fixed. It's not Turner. Um, it's that constant dynamism of that sphere. It's driven largely by those wind gust economies, but also by the incredible technology that's been there um, to move people around for centuries. Um, up to and including the navigation charts. So I, I would say that would be my take on that. I think, I think one of the things about mobility in the West or wherever we're talking about here that drives the archeologists a little bit crazy is that our folks are so mobile and their material culture shows it. And as a result, a lot of times the stuff we dig up and the sites we're dealing with do not fit well in nice, neat little boxes of the 106 process and other aspects that ask you to evaluate things like integrity in terms of whether or not the damn building stayed in one place or not. Chances are it got hauled all over the county um, on a regular basis because people moved it. And there's a lot of that kind of issue for archaeologists working in these kinds of contexts that makes it hard to do in archaeology about things with highly mobile, transient populations. But that doesn't mean it's not doable. And since you lined the ball up perfectly on the tee, <laughs> handed me that iron, here you go. Of course, Hawaii is not only part of the West, but as we've said all along, what is the West but an artificial construct? It's just the way by which you cast your eyes. And indeed, perhaps the argument might be argued that Hawaii is also part of a powerful East, as you have said, with a quest towards the East Coast of North America by those who come from Asia and meet in the middle there in Hawaii. But also, I think, too, I think the key part of it is I always have seen Hawaii not only for its uniqueness, but as this hub, as this place where not only everybody connected, but where specific commodities, as well as a spot to stop, were part of those patterns of global trade that had a profound impact not only in the development of the economy, but in the shaping of the area as reflected on the mastically, archaeologically, and, and you name it. Whether it's a white role in global wave, whether it's in the, the maritime fur trade as a place where sandalwood is gathered, whether it is a place where one finds some of the best sailors who end up not only in California, but there's a large community who are part of the First Nations 
now in British Columbia, and one of the best known families of the, uh, the Squamish and the other nations, you know, far away as well. Because, again, that west, that frontier, which I really think is the Pacific, uh, has Hawaii right at the heart of it. Never a margin, always the heart, but then the heart is always where we tend to focus. And in that, I think we always impose boundaries, put our work in margins at times, if we focus too much uh, on our specific site, in our region, in our area. Coming back to what we said earlier about, we should not be archeologists of the West. We can practice here, but what we do links to the bigger issues and to the bigger story. And in that, you know, you have to go back, take that view from the International Space Station and look at the Pacific and where it's focused. And they're talking about this, this is now the Pacific century coming. It has been for a few hundred years. We just have failed to see it. We're not there. And to go back to that idea about miles on the west, during the gold rush, people used to send their laundry to Hawaii to get them. <laughs> and fresh produce. Yeah, so, you know, it wasn't seen as a huge uh, distance that way. Well, I think that the, these questions really expose the slipperiness of these definitions and the problems that arise when we are forced to actually answer them. I don't think any of the panelists really are excited to come up with a singular definition of what the West is, or think about what they think about the role of margins, boundary, and peripheries, and that sort of thing. So I thought as a way of ending, because we all know that the reception is coming right up, um, it, just to throw back some of the phrases that the panelists use to describe the West, and we can see the contradictions and slipperiness of their own definitions from people who have a ton of years of research in this giant place that's basically half of this country or larger. So the West is, does it have hard boundary, question mark? There, the role of events, sparse population, public land, role of nostalgia, simpler past, a, a romantic concept, a rapidly paced borderland, you can try to match people to these words. Aridity, you know that's Kelly. The West is a place, the West is a proving ground. Uh, it's where we are truly human, it's a laboratory, it's an intense place, it's an imaginary space. So I think that all of the West is all of those things, it's at once none of those things, and I think that many of the papers that we will hear over the course of this conference We'll be wrestling with a number of the ideas that the folks here have brought to light today. So please thank me and share their comments. Oh, Kelly? On that note, to, to give one more concluding note. Um, so uh, on Friday morning, is that the three minute ceramic forum? <laughs> okay. There is a, a, a symposium in the three minute ceramic forum that is dedicated to a survey or the survey that was done giving uh, summaries of the, the survey of SHA membership, etc. Dr. Riley Auger is giving a three minutes uh, summary of the numbers of historical archaeology publications in the West and she's got them broken down by state. This is dedicated to the Alaska and Hawaiian questions as well as other questions. And um, I highly recommend that everybody here show up and that you can be inspired to see what states are underrepresented and marginalized. <laughs> Excellent. Well, on that.